my name is Chelsea Pope and I've worked at the Lighthouse for three years as a tour guide, um, but I also help with any restoration projects we have in there. There's always um, painting and construction that needs to be done because it's such an old building. Um, so I wear several hats there. <laughs> the Lighthouse was built in 1880 and it has had a lighthouse keeper living there with his, his family until 1977. So there's been five different families there over that period of time. Um, in 1955, the light became automated, so they really didn't need a lighthouse keeper to live there all the time anymore, but they just kept him on until 77, and now uh, the Yacht Club runs the lighthouse and makes sure the light is running at all times. So our lighthouse is a little bit different than some of the other ones. The most common style of lighthouse in our general area is imperial lighthouses. So it's basically a limestone tower, um, really tall, about twice the height as our lighthouse. Um, the King Carden Lighthouse is made of stone on the bottom and then it's wood up the tower and that's all locally sourced. And then the top is steel that was shipped over from England. The King Carden Lighthouse is a little bit different than other lighthouses in the area, again, um, with its function. So one of the major issues for boats, especially the big tall ships that we had when the town was first established coming through the harbour was that the channel between the piers is very narrow. So they really had to know what they were doing, especially since you're coming with full sails up. So the lighthouse was built to be used in conjunction with a range light, which was sort of like a mini lighthouse at the end of the same pier that the lighthouse is on. So you line up the two beams of light into one and that's how you knew you were on track to enter the harbor at the right angle. And of course you can also still use the King Carden Lighthouse to see the town from out on the lake. The light can be seen from about 21 miles out. It had a huge shipping industry. That's how all of our supplies um, came into the town and then also how everything was sent out. Just a lot easier than traveling any other way, at least at the time um, when the area wasn't quite as developed. So yeah, lots of industrial ships coming in up until I'd say the last like 30 years or so that slowed down a lot. Now it's pretty much just pleasure craft boats so we don't have the issue of the narrow channel between the piers anymore because it's just smaller boats coming in. Everyone's favorite part about going to the lighthouse is going right up to the top. Um, if everyone can make it, some people get a little nervous. Um, it, there's five flights of stairs and they get steeper and steeper as you go and the last set of stairs is actually pretty much a ladder. So I think that's something that takes the tourists off guard. They see the lighthouse from the street and it doesn't look quite as big or as tall as it actually is. So yeah, what, definitely a big part of my job is trying to comfort people as they're coming up as well as coming down. <laughs> the main part of their job was to keep the light running at all times. Um, they keep it running during the day as well as at night. So originally the lamp was um, powered by kerosene oil. So they'd have to carry usually about two barrels of oil up the stairs. And as I said, they get really steep every single day. So there's a lot of physical work involved. Uh, there was also lots of little jobs too. Um, some of the lighthouse keepers had to operate the foghorn. In the lighthouse we have a hand cranked foghorn with a bellow system in it, so they'd have to drag that outside anytime it was foggy and just sit there sounding the foghorn. <laughs> so lots of little jobs like that. And they did have it kind of good at our lighthouse because it's right downtown. Most lighthouses are out on a point somewhere or on an island and they're, the lighthouse keeper is totally isolated, but these ones, from what we understand, were very social lighthouse keepers. Um, they could just go uptown anytime they wanted. Well, the, the actual living quarters of the lighthouse is a little different than other lighthouses as well in that it's pretty much built into the tower. So for example, the lighthouse keeper's office is the second floor to the top and it's just like right in the tower. It, 
makes the architecture pretty neat in each of the rooms because you've got the angled walls. Everyone always gets a little bit dizzy once they get up into the tower. So, yeah, and we have it set up so that in each room there's a different display. Most of them are centering around the different shipwrecks that have happened in the area. So, um, the lighthouse keepers had a pretty big role, especially the Magaws, as Serafina mentioned. Um, they were a part of a lot of rescue missions, so we have a lot of information about those in there. <laughs> The bedrooms are all part of the tower as well. As you're coming up the first set of stairs, there's a little um, room jutting out to the side and you have to climb over another two steps and it definitely wouldn't meet today's safety standards, but that was the kids' bedroom. So um, you wouldn't want to be a sleepwalker. They, their door pretty much just opens up right onto the staircase. So it's a, yeah, it's a really neat little building. My name is Serafina Pagnata and this is my third summer working at the Walker House. I started in 2012 working as a tour guide and I've worked my way up from there. This year they're letting me run the place so I have a ton of fun. <laughs> um, and the best part of my job is definitely talking to people and telling them what I know about this old place and it's become very important to me so I'm really happy that I get to share with you today what I know. Uh, you are sitting in the oldest standing wooden hotel in Bruce and Gray counties and the oldest building in town. This is the Walker House and it was built in 1850 by Francis Paddy Walker. He was an Irish immigrant from the Sligo district in Ireland in 1850 and within the year he had this place built. If you come in and have a walk around it's actually a lot bigger on the inside than it looks so it's pretty impressive that they were able to finish building it as quickly as they did. Um, so as mentioned it was built as a hotel and a tavern by an Irishman so Tons of people were, came through here um, for well over 100 years and in its long history there have only been about two families that have owned it. Um, the Walkers had it until 1942 when it was bought by the Garens family and they also had it as a hotel and later a boarding house and the reason we're a museum today is actually because of a fire that went through the place in 1995. Um, there are pictures all over the house and just the amount of destruction and devastation that the volunteers walked into three years after the fire. I just couldn't have imagined walking into that and thinking, yes, we can save this building, it's worth it. So um, the fact that they were able to do it was just amazing. It took them 10 years and it was a bunch of volunteers and retirees that came in every afternoon and fixed this place up and the fact that it's done and still open is amazing. It's all volunteers. Patty had seven sons and his son John took over the Walker House after Patty died. And John had, I think, seven, seven daughters and three sons, so the Walker name dropped off pretty quickly, but the Walker descendants still own the place until the 1940s, and then the Garens family bought it and had it until the 90s, so there have only been two families that have owned the place. We keep the house pretty much well set up as a museum, and it keeps it as a hotel as much as we can. All of the bedrooms upstairs still have a lot of the old furniture in it. A lot of the furniture in the house is original to the Walker family, because when the fire happened, none of it was here. Uh, Marie Garens had brought a lot of her own furniture with her when she moved in, so when the Walkers moved out, all of their furniture went with them. So we do have a ton of the original furniture that would have come with the Walker family from Ireland with them, which is pretty neat. Uh, we have the original 
tabletop in the kitchen, so the original harvest table is still sitting in the kitchen. Um, the tavern is still set up and we do have pub nights every once in a while, so we keep Patty happy that way. And we do still have his, his bed and dresser in his bedroom upstairs. And we have tons of stuff from shipwrecks that's been pulled out of the water um, that was decades ago. So before all of the bans on that were put in place, so we have a lot of it um, on display so you can see bits and pieces of the wrecks that are still sitting at the bottom of the lake. The majority of our visitors are usually tourists. They're visiting from other areas, but every once in a while we do get a local in if they're bringing family from visiting from somewhere with them. So the majority of our guests are tourists and they just come in because it's a museum. But every once in a while we do get a local that comes in and says, wow, I have had no idea how much history we actually have around here. This is fantastic. So when we do get locals, we're very excited because they're once in a blue moon. <laughs> I'm Deanna Gleason, this is my first year at the Walker House. I'm going to my fourth year at Carleton University studying History and American Sign Language. And I'm going to tell you some pretty interesting stories like local legends and more lighthearted stuff. So the legend of the Phantom Piper is a good concurrent urban legend. So the story goes, there's a ship coming in from Scotland and it was coming up towards the harbour when a fog rolled in. So the ship couldn't see the harbour anymore. There's no lighthouse at the time. So there's a man on board who's a piper, and he thought the ship was going down, so he pulled his bagpipes and played a lament for the ship. When he stopped his lament, he heard an echo from shore. So he heard the echo, and they played back and forth until the ship was safely able to come into the harbour. And then in gratitude for the rest of his life, every night he'd go stand at the end of the pier and play his bagpipes for 10, 15 minutes in hopes that he'd save someone's life or another ship would hear him if he needed it. And then the legend goes that and during the summer, every night at sundown, you can hear the, pipe, the pipers play down the sun from the lighthouse. Oh, the great storm of 1913. So there was a local boy and he had been sailing on one of the ships. And, but just before the storm, he decided to quit his job and leave. So that ship went out and sunk with all hands on deck. So his family thought he had died. So they're having a wake for him when he showed up, slightly intoxicated. And his mom got mad at him, told him to leave until it was over. Because they would put the money into it, so they had to have the party. So Lyman, Lyman oh, that's a boat. Okay. Davis was the last commercial schooner on the Great Lakes. During the Great Storm, it did harbor in Concordia, so it survived the storm. And eventually it was sold to an entertainment co company in the 1930s when they took it to Toronto. And for entertainment purposes, they lit it full of fireworks and blew it up in the harbor because it's the 1930s, so you needed cheap entertainment. Oh yeah, we had quite a few boat builders. Um, one family is the McGaw family who has been mentioned multiple times before. So lighthouse keepers, rest, search and rescue. They also built quite fast boats, and one of the boats, the Water Lily, won the Fisherman's Regatta three years in a row. And they built another one called the Belgian Anne, or something. Belgian Anne, which also won three times, though not consecutively. Okay, good. I love learning about like all the interesting characters in concurrent history, because I just always thought concurrent history is like, there's people, they're all Scottish. But there's a lot of non-Scottish, very exciting people who have interesting stories. at a town council meeting that maybe they should reroute the river and build a proper harbour because this was becoming quite a commercial port and the natural harbour was, it was dangerous and a lot of the tall ships they would um, founder on the way in. So Patty sort of took the idea in stride and ran with it and he got a group of his friends together in the middle of the night and they went with their shovels to the end of what is now Harbour Street and dug through the sand dunes and let the Penetango River do the rest. So the harbor is now accidentally on purpose, coincidentally, conveniently located right next to Patty Walker's hotel. So this was the first place that a lot of settlers saw when they got off the boats. And the lighthouse wasn't built until 1880. So this place was here for a solid 30 years before the lighthouse was built. So this literally was the first place you saw. So a hot meal and a warm bed. And this is where a lot of settlers stayed as their own farm homes were being built. So hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of people would have been through here at one time or another and would have stayed here. Uh, so my name is Carolyn Diemert. This is my first year at the Walker House. 
I'm originally from Mild May, but I love the beach so much that I decided to come work here. I am going into my third year at the University of Waterloo and I study Fine Arts and History, so it's a perfect summer job. Um, I'm going to be talking about the brawl at the harbour. So um, there was um, to be a vote from everyone in Bruce County. So people from Walkerton had to walk all the way up to King Carden and they were voting over the harbour. So everyone had to pay taxes on the harbour and the people from Walkerton and Inland didn't want to pay because they weren't um, necessarily involved directly with the harbour. They were um, eventually using the goods that came through, but they decided they didn't want to pay for that, just the people in King Carden should. So essentially they hated each other because King Carden was forcing the Inlanders to pay and they didn't want to, so they hated King Carden. So um, between 19, or 1850 and 1880, um, there was to be this vote, so everyone from Walkerton marched up here and they didn't want to um, stay in the hotels, so they actually slept on the beach and had their own whiskey so they didn't have to go to the taverns. Um, and Patty figured out that this gentleman who had the voters list was around, so him and a bunch of buddies convinced him to come into the tavern and they drank a little whiskey, had some fun, and they eventually stole the voters list from them and buried it in a sand dune. And eventually this gentleman figured it out and there was a big brawl right in front of Patty's house at the harbour, the hotel, because where was the voters list? So eventually they found it and everyone voted and it was um, decided that everyone had to pay for the harbour because they'd be using the goods anyways. So. Big Tom McGaw was actually a lighthouse keeper, um, one of the early lighthouse keepers, and it was his family that were the first search and rescue team in King Carden. So after the wreck of the Anne Maria in 1902, which is one of our more famous shipwreck stories, um, that was sort of the last straw for Big Tom McGaw. He thought too many people are dying out on the lake and nobody's doing anything about it. So he built the first rescue, search and rescue vessels and um, they had a little shed at the edge of the pier. And so when further storms happened, like the Singapore was in 1904 and they saved everybody on board. And in the great storm of 1913, of course, they were out there trying to rescue as many people as they could, but unfortunately, the majority of the vessels went down with every soul on board, so. Stuff washes up on shore all the time. Like right behind you, we have um, some of the boards from shipwrecks that would have come in. And then in one of our display cases, we have bits and pieces of the wreck of the Erie Bell, which was one of our other famous shipwreck stories. You can still see the boiler, what's left of the boiler at Boiler Beach and we have the culprit of the explosion sitting in our display case, so it would have been the steam vent. Um, the steam vent would have been held shut by the engineer as long as possible on the boiler so that they could rescue the JN Carter, which is the ship they were out there for in the beginning anyway. Um, they had to pull it off the rocks, the Uri Bell was a tugboat, and so the steam vent would have held the boiler shut as long as possible to get as much force to pull this boiler, um, sorry, the schooner off of the rocks, but unfortunately it exploded. Well, King Carden, it's, it's been around since 1848 when it was established as Penetangor and it is definitely a beautiful little town that, well, when Patty got here, they actually went right past it and had to turn around and come back because the settlement was still so small at the time and we're told that people still do that, but once they get here and they see what King Carden has to offer, like our beautiful sunsets, uh, which we are world famous for. <laughs> It's just an amazing place to be and an amazing place to grow up and to visit and to keep coming back to as much as you can. <laughs>